Shudraka Smichakatika, the significance of Act 1. In order to understand the significance of Act 1, we should focus on the text. Last day, in our discussion of the text, we found that the play begins with a benediction offered to Lord Shiva. And after the benediction, there is a short introduction to the play and then a discussion about the playwright. After discussing the playwright, the Shutradhar manager comes on the stage and then describes the central theme of the play. The central theme we identified is related to the central love between Chaludatta and Vasantasena. And there is also the question of, of the state. King Palaka is a ruler of the state of Avantika or Ujjaini, and a new rebel hero, Arakya, he will be dethroning the king through an act of usurpation, through an act of revolution against the king, overthrow of power of the king. The play also depicts the contemporary society. And at the center, there is a trial scene. The court proceedings are shown. The corruption of the age revealed through the trial scene. We also have the representation of the wicked person. And the action is related to the villainy. And finally, there is also the resolution of the plot. After introducing the theme, the writer gradually introduces the character. By now we know about the main characters of the play, mainly Chaludatta and Vasantasena. They are introduced by the manager or Shutradhar. So after the end of the prelude, we have the next section of the first act, act one of the play. Enter with a clock in his hand, Maitriya. Maitriya as the name suggests is a close confidante, friend of Charudatta. So he starts his speech. Rather I Maitreya himself ought really to be seeking invitations from others. Oh fortune, what a wretched state I am reduced to when the Vardhi Charudatta was still prosperous. I used to gratify only with the most delicious, fragrant sweetmeats prepared day and night with great care and seated at the gateway of the inner courtyard, surrounded by hundreds of dishes. I would simply touch them like a painter and thrust them aside like a bull in the city market. I would remove and remain chewing the cut at Lisa. But now that he is poor, I have to wander about here, there, and everywhere to pick up such crumbs as I can get and return here only to roost for my refuge like a domesticated pigeon. This opening statement, opening speech of Maitreya serves a choric function. It is also a part of the exposition. In classical Greek play or Roman play, we have the presence of the chorus. Chorus usually describe the past, comments on the present, and then introduces the characters and the themes. In Sanskrit play, we have Shutradhar introducing the play. And then the characters gradually come on the stage and perform their roles. In this play, the opening statement of Maitreya gives us certain information about the past. So Chaludatta, once upon a time, was a rich merchant. And Maitreya, his friend, had this fortune when Chaludatta was prosperous, the fortune to gratify himself with good food, good clothing, good shelter. And he was surrounded, as he says, by hundreds of dishes. And therefore, he had the time and leisure, happiness, entertainment, when he was rich, when Charudatta was rich. But now the condition has changed. 
and that same Charudatta who was once upon a time a rich man has turned into a poor man. So he informs us about that. The past is narrated and the present is also located in the play. Charudatta has now become poor and therefore Maitreya, his friend, has to wander about here and there and everywhere just to collect food. Crumbs means food, as I get. And return here only to roost, the refuge, like a domesticated pigeon. So he is uh, nagging about his condition, lamenting his present condition. Then he informs about the present state of Charudatta. This mental scented with jasmine flowers has been sent for the Vardhi Charudatta by his good friend, Churnavidda, who bade me to take it to Charudatta when he has finished his devotions. So now I shall look for the Reverend Charudatta, respected Charudatta. So he's walking on the stage, looking around. Charudatta comes. Here comes Charudatta, taking oblation unto the household deities. So praying to the household deities after having finished his devotions. Charudatta's character is also revealed through this speech. That is a devout Brahmin and performs this religious rituals with devotion. Charudatta enters along with Radhanika. Radhanika is a slave woman associated to this household. So Charudatta says, looking up and sighing with grief. While formerly at the threshold of the door of my house, the oblation offered my bee was immediately eaten away by swans and multitudes of cranes. Now at that very same threshold on which are shot the blades of grass, the cavity full of grain offered by me falls, being merely licked by mouth by worms. So he's sighing with grief at his present condition. Once upon a time when he was rich, he used to offer good prasad to the god and could offer these to the birds and animals. And therefore swans and cranes used to come and eat the grains offered by him. But now even the courtyard grass has grown tall and only the worms can eat. So he walks about very short, slowly, seats himself. Vidushaka comes. Here is Vardhi Charudatta. I shall then approach him. So approaching Charudatta, he says, Adieu to you, sir. May you prosper. So salutation, normal salutation. Vidushaka is also a common character whom we find in the classical Sanskrit drama. In most of the classical Sanskrit drama, this Vidushaka plays an important role. So in Sanskrit dramaturgy, Vidushaka usually is related to the good person, the Nita. Here again we find in this Prakaran the presence of a Vidushaka. Starudatta says, Lo, here is come Maitriya, the friend in all seasons. Welcome, friend, be seated. So as you command, he seats himself and says, Friend, this mantle which is scented with jasmine flowers has been sent to you by your dear friend. Chunavidda, who bade me. So this Vidushaka's role played by character Maitreya, friend, and he offers the flower. This is to be presented to you to the worthy Charudatta when he has finished his worship to the gods. Presents the mantle. So we find that Charudatta is much respect and reverend among the friends also. So he receives it and remains thoughtful. Vidushaka says, well, what are you thinking about? Charudatta says, friend, Verily, happiness appears to advantage after one has undergone miseries. So our suffering can be best understood when one has passed through a stage of happiness. Similarly, happiness can, should have, can be best understood when one has spent his days in miseries. The present state of Charudatta is a state of misery. And in this state of misery, he can understand the advantages of happiness. In such, in much the same way as the sight of a lamp amidst thick darkness. So the lamp and the darkness, these are contrasted. There is this employment of alankara. Alankara in classical 
poetic theory refers to the use of figurative language in mrichakatika we find extensive use of alamkara alamkara if we translate that into english it becomes figurative language figures of speech so here we have the combination of the sanskrit alamkara in order to represent the thought process so in case of a metaphor or simile we have an implied or explicit comparison between two objects two things here also we find the comparison is made between two ideas first is that when one has been undergoing the state of misery for that person the image of happiness appears to be much cherished favorable in the same way like the sight of a lamp when someone is in a state of darkness so darkness is compared to misery while lamp or light is compared to human happiness on the other hand that man who falls from affluence to penury affluence means rich and penury means misery poverty so one man who falls from affluence to penury is one who is really dead and exists only as being supported by a body so without that there is no happiness and one who has turned into abject poverty can only understand the importance of happiness and riches vidushaka says friend what will you prefer then death or poverty which one is more preferred by you death or poverty charudatta says ah my friend between poverty and death certainly shall death be agreeable to me and not poverty death is only a transient suffering of short duration while poverty is an endless misery so these thoughts come from charudatta's mind so his mind is in a state of gloom perpetual gloom sorrow so he regards death as an escape from this endless misery of life because of his abject poverty vidushaka his friend always remains very close he is a friend of all seasons even in his poverty charudatta has the company of vidushaka he says my dear friend enough of your repentance in the case of you whose riches is only transferred on to the needy people even the very ruin of wealth wins an added charm as in the case of the moon reduced to the slender fragment after having been drunk by the gods so again we have the use of alamkara charudatta is a person who is much charitable so even in this state of poverty charudatta has this propensity to give gifts to his friends known person so whatever he has he gives to others so this character of charudatta has been compared to the moon so moon has seen its full moon or the glorious days and gradually what the moon does moon wanes and is reduced to a crescent shape and finally to new moon and this is compared to the process of of drinking the moon by the gods so this abstract imaginative metaphor has been used here the imagery is very interesting so alamkara is supported by a descriptive power of the poet and that has the power of imagery charudatta says my good friend i do not grieve for my ruined wealth look it is this alone that afflicts me that my guests abandon my house because of its wealth having vanished just like the fluttering bees that abandon the temples of an elephant the season being over when the dense rut thereon had been dried up so what is this lamentation the main cause is that being poor he cannot offer any charitable gift to others and because of this absence of any kind of gift any wealth even the people who used to come and flock to his house they go missing they are not coming to his house 
and this is compared again with the help of an alamkara a metaphor this state is compared to the beehive that is abandoned okay beehive that is abandoned just like the fluttering bees that abandon the temple of an elephant the season being over when the dense rut thereon had been dried up okay when the beehive has become dried the bees leave even the temples are bereft of the bees vidushaka says oh friend confound these riches which are but merely morning meals trifling so what are riches riches come and go they are just trifflings they are just trifflings like like is used as a simile to compare one thing to another like cowboys in a wood that are afraid of wasps these riches riches resort only to places where nobody has a bite at them so the again an interesting simile has been used so wherever the wasp do not bite the people the riches can be enjoyed so but here the state is just the opposite charudutta says truly my anxiety is not due to the loss of my wealth for riches come and vanish in accordance with the course of fortune this is a philosophy that that uh, considers destiny as very important in life so people depend on fortune so it is a course of fortune money will come money will go but it is the fact that pains me to the quick that people fall off from even the friendship of him who has lost his support of wealth but the worst thing in life is that a poor man does not have any friend even the friends abandon the person when there is no wealth again because of penury because of poverty man is overcome with shame there is a sense of guilt and shame overwhelmed with shame he is deprived of his dignity there is a loss of self respect loss of dignity devoid of self respect he is despised he is not liked by others and being despised he becomes depressed in spirit so this is the way the world works and we have a picture of the contemporary society society has become more materialistic a person who has been deprived of wealth loses the company of friends and becomes an object of ridicule by society is despised and becomes depressed in spirit and because of this depression grief comes overwhelmed with grief he becomes bereft of his intellect because of his sorrow because of his sadness this man lacks his intelligence his reason his common sense and when consequently his judgment fails he at last is brought to ruin so the last stage is that when the person has lost his sense of judgment he becomes totally thoroughly ruined alas poverty is the root of all fortunes so this last expression is an example of of apostrophe so poverty as the root of misfortune vidushaka says friend remember the wealth is after all but a trifle and cease your grief do not be so sad be cheerful always remember that wealth come and go and it is just a trifle so in this materialist world vidushaka his friend is offering some kind of solace asking this friend to look at the better side of life that in misery in poverty a man understands the true nature of human beings charudatta says the poverty of a man is to him a home of cares a great another form of enmity the abhorrence of his friends and the source of dislike of the general public and of his kinsmen it is the cause of humiliation from his wife and consequently it begets a desire to retire to the forest so vana prastha that is the way a poor man must pursue because this person has lost his self respect has lost the caring love that of inmates of the family offer him it becomes a experience that is humiliating and therefore the dislike of the friend dislike of the family members everything forces this man to take the route to forest or vanaprastha 
and the fire of grief in the heart that is dormant does not burn but is constantly tormenting so this sorrow keeps on tormenting the individual who has become poor then friend i have already offered oblation into the household gods so household gods are worshiped even during that period second century ad or fifth century bc the household gods were offered worship and he says that i have already offered oblation into the household gods you to go and present the offering to the divine mothers at the place where the four reed roads meet so go to the city go near the junction and there is a temple there and please go and offer your prayers to the divine mothers vidushaka says no no i will not go charuta says why not vidushaka says because the god are not gracious towards you even though thus worshiped so what use is there in worshiping gods so he is trying to rationalize the reason why he is stunned atheist he does not believe in gods because he says that while charudatta is worshiping the gods the god has not shown grace or mercy towards charudatta but charudatta instructs his friend no friends don't say so don't be a theist don't be a disbeliever this is the constant duty of every householder so this is our duty to pray to gods the household gods the gods when they are ever adored with penance contemplation and prayer the oblative offerings are always gracious towards the devotees so god sees the truth and whatever offering that the person is giving to gods the way the person is worshiping the god the god will always offer the blessings to human beings and therefore there is no use in discussing about it therefore go please and present the offerings unto the divine mothers vidushaka on the other hand says no sir i will not go send it appoint somebody else with me a poor brahman everything seems to go wrong in the same way as in the case of the reflection in a mirror so when you look at a mirror what happens so the mirror offers you a kind of virtual image so everything turns right hand becomes left the left hand becomes right besides at this hour of evening courtesans sensualists servants and royal favorites move freely upon the king's highway so the road is crammed with people from different spheres of life in the evening the court mistresses the sensualists those who chase the courtesans the servants public servants and even the royal favorites they move on the highway of the king i shall fall a prey to them like a mouse in the path of a fierce snake greedy of frogs so once again a metaphor has been used like this is a simile example of simile so i shall become a prey to them like a mouse mouse that falls in the path of a greedy snake or frogs and what will you do sitting here so you also will be alone in this house you will also be bored so i will not go charudatta says very well wait a while i shall go through my holy meditation so charudatta again goes to pray to the gods and starts meditating tapasya so this is the opening scene okay the first episode that we see a conversation between charudatta and vidushaka and through this discussion we understand we get a glimpse of the present state of charudatta we are also informed about his past life there is this transition of the scene so behind the scene the transition of scene takes place in such a way on the stage two characters take the corner stage or they just hide behind the arras a curtain is there at the backdrop and another space is revealed so behind the scenes a new space is revealed so it is a kind of continuous action that is shown on the stage the stage properties are presented in such a way so as to suggest the change in setting so we have a 
fluid movement from one scene to another scene. So Act 1 has the first episode where we have Charudatta and Vidushaka discussing about their present condition. Now the second scene of Act 1 moves to the streets and we find a hide and chase game going on. This scene, so someone is saying stop Vasanta Sena stop. So behind the scene the sound comes and then Vasanta Sena pursued by Vita, Sakara and his servants. So Vasanta Sena is running away and he is pursued, chased by, by Vita, Sakara and the servants. So Vita says, Vasanta Sena stop, Vasanta Sena stop, throwing forward your feet that are expert in the art of dancing. So Vasanta Sena has already been introduced. She is the leading courtesan of this society, very famous for her for her art of dancing and she is a master of the 64 forms of Kala, Chosat Kala that became very popular during this time. Even in the introduction, Shudraka has been appreciated for knowing all the Kalas. So Vasanta Sena is a representative figure, an artist who is a master of all the arts. So Vita says, Vasanta Sena, stop throwing towards your feet that are expert in the art of dancing. Why do you, whose delicacy is transformed by fear, why are you fleeing like a female deer, frightened by the pursuit of hunter, your terrified eyes darting tremulous side glances? So through this discussion, through this description, we have the mudras of Vasanta Sena made visible to the audience. And we can see that there is this there is this expression of fear. She must have seen something that she is scared of. Some persons are chasing her. And Vasanta Sena in this scene is dressed like a courtesan, full of jewels on her body. So Sakara, Sakara is the son of son-in-law, sorry, brother-in-law of the king, Palaka. Sakara says, Stop, Vasanta Sena, stop. Why do you flee? Why do you run? Why do you retreat? Stumbling at every step. Oh, young maiden, be kind. You shall not die. Stop, stop, please. My heart, oh sweet lady, is burning with love. Like a piece of meat that has fallen into a heap of blazing coals. So his love, as expressed by Sakara, is a love that can be compared to a piece of meat that is burning in the heap of blazing coal. What type of love is this? This is a material love. This is a love that is corrupt and based on lust. So this lusty Sakara is pursuing Vasanta Sena, chasing her and Vasanta Sena is trying to escape Sakara. Cheta again says, stop worthy lady, stop. In terror you flee away from me like a peahen, like a peahen in summer with a tail in full feather. But my lord and master is leaping after you like a young cock in the wood. So double simile. So she's escaping like a peahen in summer, full of feather. In full feather means dressed like a beautiful peahen. And then he refers to the master. Master is leaping you like a young cock in the wood. So this man is chasing the female. Vita says, Vasanta Sena, stay, stay. Why do you run away trembling like the young plantain tree, banana tree, trailing after you, your red garment whose cart is moving in the wind and throwing now and again multitudes of buds of red lotuses, thereby resembling the cave of red arsenic shattered by the axe. So you are so beautiful, your dress is red in color and you are moving, you are running away. So you remember like the multitudes of red lotuses. You must have seen red lotus and the petals of red lotus. And here Vasanthe Sena's dress is compared to that by Vita. Sakara says, stop Vasanthe Sena, stop. You inflame my passion, my desire, my love. And at night you deprive me of my sleep in bed. 
but now you fly in terror from me, stumbling at every step. So Sakara has fallen in love with Vasanta Sena. She he is charmed by the beauty, and he is chasing her. He says that she has she has inflamed him, inflamed him, and the desire of the love grows, and even he is deprived of his normal sleep in night. But you have fallen into my hands as Kunti fell into the Ravana, into those of Ravana. So one reference is that the story of Kunti and Ravana. So do you think that this story is okay? Kunti, did Kunti fall in the hands of Ravana? We know no, it is not the same case. But you have fallen into my hands as Kunti fell into those of Ravana. Actually, Sita fell in the hands of Ravana. So Sakara is drunk and Sakara is speaking nonsense. He does not have any knowledge of the contemporary tales, especially the tales of Ravana and Rama. And he is referring to Kunti as one who has fallen in the hands of Ravana. Actually, Sita was stolen by Ravana. Vita says, Vasanta Sena, again calling, with strides far excelling my own. So you're running so fast. Why do you run like a female serpent, overcome with fear for the lord of the birds, Garuda? So this serpent means snake and Garuda. This myth is also there in Hindu mythology. And we find that this is a perpetual fight between the serpent and the bird, Garuda. So Garuda always chases the serpent, the serpent escapes. So running very fastly, Vasanthasana is compared to the female serpent, the snake, while they consider themselves as Garuda, chasing the snake. Running very fastly, I can even arrest the speed of the wind itself. However, I shall, he says that, yes, I can walk, I can run much faster. However, I shall make no effort to overtake thee. Oh, fair limbed one. So fair limbed one is Vasanta Sena. So we find the difference between the male and the female. The gender difference has been made clear. So this society is also a patriarchal society where the masculine strength, power is, these are all acclaimed. And then the female is converted, is stated to be a passive being, more a feminine being, weak person. Sakara says, friend, friend, she is a whip to lust of the stealers of coin. She is fish eater, figurante of snub house, destroyer of family, untamable casket of love, courtesan, respectable of good ornaments, harlot, prostitute, and concubine. So these are the curses he's stating. So the words that are there describing Vasanta Sena, these are derogatory and make Vasanta Sena as a time pleaser, a person who uses her art, her beauty, her charms in order to in order to attract men and in that way destroy the family and with her casket of love, she is more fond of fond of ornaments. So she is simply a prostitute and a harlot and a concubine. I have invoked her by these 10 names and still she does not love me. So Sakara says that I have appealed to this Vasanta Sena with so many good names. According to him, these are good names. But yet she is not reciprocating his love. So he's uh, like our modern day villains chasing the heroines. So Sakara is chasing the heroine. Vita says, like a female crane starting away from the thunder of clouds, why should you flee from us? Why are you escaping from us? Overcome with your fear. Your cheeks are being rubbed by the tossing earrings so that you resemble the lute struck by the nails of Vita's. Sakara says, why? Why do you run like Draupadi, afraid of Rama? See the joke. So why are you running like Draupadi afraid of Rama? So two epics are brought together. Draupadi is a character from the Mahabharata. So we re remember the Mahabharata episode where Draupadi is disrobed by the Kauravas in the court. So here Draupadi is being chased by Rama while your various ornaments 
make a jingling and a tinkling noise. So such uh, a society was that, very permissive society, where the epical heroes and heroines, they could be easily uh, represented in new ways and in concocted plots. Sakara is a man of little learning and, then, and definitely he's a dangerous man. And he has a very little knowledge about the classical Sanskrit epics. He confuses. Previously, we saw that Ravana is snatching Kunti away. Now we find that Draupadi is being chased by Rama. Here shall I seize you quickly as Hanuman sees Shubhadra, the sister of Vishwasu. So where is the story? There is no story like this. Hanumana, we know, appointed by Rama. He was a follower, disciple of Rama, went to Lanka in order to rescue Sita. But here Hanumana is seizing Subhadra. So Sita says, sport him, sport with him, who is beloved of the king. So he's asking Vasantasena to sport with this person, Sakara. Sakara is the brother-in-law of king, Palaka. Therefore, very powerful man in society. So he is trying to, Chita is trying to say, sport with him, who is beloved of the king. And you shall eat flesh and fish. So you will have wealth, riches, if you can accept the proposals, the indecent proposals of Sakara. When they can get fish and flesh, dogs do not prey upon carrion. Even the dogs, when they get good fish, good flesh, they do not be, uh, remain scavengers chasing the dead bodies. So he is offering Cheta, another servant of Sakara, is offering temptations to Vasantasena. So Vasantasena is tempted by the lure of wealth of Sakara. He is being, she is being tempted by the power, the wealth, the privileges. Vita says, Varti Vasantasena, oh wonderful, why do you advance in terror and amazement? Looking like the guardian goddess of the city, as if we are a girdle resting on your slender waist and glittering with star-like gems, and also have a pale countenance like a rubbed powder of red arsenic. Beautiful description, evocative description also makes us aware of the jewels that Vasantasena is putting on. Sakara says, hotly pursued by us as is the female jackal by hounds in a forest. So is this female jackal? Vasantasena is this female jackal. And who are the hounds? These hounds are Sakara, Vita. They are chasing Vasantasena. You run hastily and impetuously, stealing my heart with its very roots. So Vasantasena is trying, shouting, Pallavaka, Pallavaka, Parabhritaka, Parabhritika. So she is asking for help because these people, they are bad people. They are chasing her. Sakara with fear. Friend, a man, a man. Someone is there on the street. Vita says, don't fear, don't fear. Vasantasena, oh, Madhavika, Madhavika. So in the street, she is calling for help. Vasantasena shouts and calls Madhavika. Vita laughing, ah, fool. She is seeking her attendance. Sakara says, friend, friend, is she, after all, seeking a woman? Vita says, why, of course? Sakara says, I will kill hundred of women. I am a brave man. So this does not show his courage. Rather, it is a kind of statement against himself. Sakara tries to prove that he is very heroic. He has very power, good power, strength. And what he is boasting of? He is boasting of the strength of power of killing hundreds of women and says that I am a brave man. So Vasantan Sena, finding herself very lonely and helpless, Alas, alas, indeed, even my attendants have disappeared. No one is there to accompany, protect her. I must trust to myself alone for my escape. So Vita says, search about, search about. Where is she hiding? Let us search her. Sakara. Vasantasena. Bewail, bewail for your kaku, para Brithika, or for Pallavaka, or even for all the spring days. Huh, who is going to protect you? When I am pursuing you, 
Vihi Bhima Sena, the son of Jamadagni. Bhim, Bhima in Ramayana. You remember Bhima? Bhima, sorry, in Mahabharata. Bhima, Pandava. So Bhima Sena, the son of the son of Kunti. Or even the ten headed Ravana. Ravana, the son of Kunti. So Kunti is brought from Ramayana and Kunti is made the father, made the mother of Ravana. So thorough confusion. So full of, uh, full of situational laughter is generated through these dialogues of Sakara. Sakara appears to us like a imbecile, a fool, a person who is not aware of the realities or even aware of the epics. So he's saying that, uh, or even the ten-headed Ravana, the son of Kunti, seizing thee by the hair, I shall act in the imitation of Dushashana. Dushashana again from Mahabharata. You remember Dushashana was there in the court scene where the disroping of Draupadi takes place. So he compares himself with Dushashana. Look here, look here. The sword is very sharp and your head too is turned to us. I shall cut off the head or better kill you. Enough of running of yours, verily. He who is about to die will not live. Vasanta Sena says, what this, sir? I am a weak woman. Vita says, hence it is that you are still alive. Because you are weak, therefore we are not killing you. You are alive. Sakara says, that is why you are not killed. Vasanta Sena says, oh, even his karsi appalls me. Very well, let it be so. So she says aloud, Sir, do you seek my ornament from me? Do you want this ornament that I am putting on? Vita says, God forbid, worthy Vasantasena, the creeper of a pleasure garden does not deserve to be robbed of its blossoms. Therefore, speak no more about your ornaments. Vasantasena asks, Then what? what is all this about? Sakara says, I am an excellent personage, a regular Vasudeva, and you must love me. So I am an embodiment of love, Vasudeva, or Kamadeva, I am the embodiment of love, and you should reciprocate my love. He even compares himself to Krishna and appeals to Vasanta um, Sena that he is a beloved. Vasanta Sena becomes very angry, hush. So see how Sringar Rasa is now being turned and new type of rasa related to excitement, amazement, disgust. Okay, so we rasa is also presented in a new way. Vasantasena indignantly, so Krodh, Radra rasa. Hush, get you gun. He talk what is base and unworthy. So I do not want to hear your words. Whatever you are saying is bad, odious. Sakara clapping his hand and laughing. Friend, friend, just see a while. This courtesan lady is very affectionate towards me. In as much as she says to me, come, you are weary, you are fatigued. No, no, I have not been going astray in any village or town. But the lady, I swear by my friend's head and by my own feet, it is only by chasing about at your heels that I have grown tired and weary. Vita gives a side, what? <laughs> the fool takes it to be shant, weary. When she says shant, shant, shant means weary and shant means peace. When she is asking for peace, he is talking about weariness. Vasanta Sena. So he speaks aloud. Vasanta Sena. You say something that is inconsistent with the living of a courtesan. So a courtesan is expected in society that anyone who offers this courtesan a bounty, money, wealth, she must reciprocate her love towards him. So this is reminded by Vita. And Vita says, let it be remembered that the abode of a courtesan is the free resort of youth. So the place of a courtesan is to gratify the desires of young men. And that is the job of a courtesan. Also remember that you, a courtesan, you are like a creeper that grows by a roadside. So like the creeper that is a parasite, 
lives on the basis of the food that is supplied by the parent plant. So you also, like a creeper of the roadside, you are a courtesan. You have a person that has this price, as if the life of a courtesan is totally purchasable. So you have a person that has this price and is consequently to be secured by wealth. Therefore, oh good one, serve equally the man you love and him you hate. So we know have already come to this knowledge that Vasantasana has fallen in love with Charudatta, not because of his wealth. Charudatta is a poor man. And yet Vasantasana is in love with Charudatta. On the other hand, there is this rich man, Sakara, a very powerful man, the brother-in-law of King Palaka, offering his love to Vasantasana. But Vasantasana makes her choice very clear. And therefore, we have two persons. One, a real lover of Vasantasana Charudatta. The other is a false pursuer, a lusty pursuer of Charudatta, of Vasantasena. So here, again, he says that the wisest and the most, the wisest and the most learned Brahman, the meanest and the idiotic outcast, both bathe in the same, self same pool. A blooming creeper is bent low beneath the peacock, no less beneath the crow. Shudras and other cross water and others cross waters by or are ferried over in the very same boat by which the Brahmin, the Kshatri and the Vashyas do cross. You are a courtesan and so like a tank, a creeper and a boat, bestow your welcome upon all alike. So this talks about the rigidity of caste that is prevalent during, even during that society. So he talks about the fourfold Chaturvarna in society. So Chaturvarna, we know, is the fourfold classification of caste in the Indian context. So Brahman, Shatri, and Vashas, they all travel by the same boat as a Shudra does. So you are a courtesan. So you are like that boat. So like a tank, a creeper, and a boat, bestow your welcome upon all alike. So like a boat that is used by all people belonging to different caste, you, a courtesan, is a person who can be used by the public and you should welcome all the people alike. So this was a poor state of the courtesan in that contemporary society. As, was, as I was going through the history of Ujjain, I found that Ujjain was a city. So of uh, second century AD, where this court culture and the courtier culture and the courtesan culture all went hand in glove. We have this, the prostitutes who are working for the gratification of male desire. And this institution remained, this is an age old institution that has always considered the female as an object of desire and has relegated the female to the margins. Even in the temples, we have the tradition of the Devadasis. And these Devadasis were all regarded as the Dasis of God, but actually they were treated as prostitutes, as public property, mainly enjoyed by the priestly class. Vasanta Sena says, verily, merit alone inspires love and not violence. See the interesting comment, the concept of love. Shudrakas Michakatika is really a statement, a kind of moral statement on different aspects of love. And here we have two types of loves. So one is a love that is based on trust, merit, goodness, faith, belongingness, self-conscious interdependence. The other type of love is more carnal, based on desire, lust. So we have this contradictions. And Vasantinsina always talks about love as something related to merit and not to violence. Sakara says, friend, friend, ever since this bond slave, see bond slave, that is the status of a courtesan. The interesting part of the society of this play is that Vasantasana at the end of the play is reconciled, is brought in the main fold of society. She's accepted as a wife by Chaludatta at the end of the play. So this mobility of status of a female. But here Sakara is uh, treating her as a born slave. 
slave went, a prostitute went to the garden in the temple of Kamadeva. So she has to dedicate her life to the lusty people, sensuous people, and she has to dedicate her life in the temple of Kamadeva. So here you have Sakara telling about Vasantasina's status as a prostitute. She is in love with Charudatta, that pen in a stretch, and she does not love me. His house is to the left. Let my friend act in such a way that she does slip from our hand. So we must catch her. We must see that she does not slip from our hand. So Vita gives a sight. This fool speaks out that very thing that ought to be concealed. So even Vita is shown as more intelligent than Sakara, although Vita is a servant. So this servant is more clever than the master. And he says that this fool Sakara speaks out what should be concealed. What? Vasantasina is attached to Vardhi Charudatta. It is indeed rightly said that the gem suits with a gem. Therefore, let her go. I have had enough of this fool. So Vita also says that yes, she deserves Charudatta better than this man. This man is a fool. But he also plays dual role because he is a servant and much afraid of Sakara. So aloud he says, oh son of an unmarried woman, is the house of that famous merchant on our left? Sakura says, exactly so. His house is on the left. Vasantasena gives an aside. Oh, wonderful. If it is true that his house is to the left, I am really obliged by his wicked fellow in every act of injuring me in as much as he has enabled me to meet my beloved. So Charudatta house is located very nearby and Vasantasena comes to know about it through this conversation between Sakara and Vita. And she finds a kind of refuge in the house of Charudatta. And we will soon find her sliding through the doors of Charudatta and entering into the house of Charudatta. Sakara says, friend, friend, in this pitchy darkness, where while she is visible yet, Vasantasena has really escaped like a grain of soot in the heap of black beans. Vita says, oh, it is pitch dark. Indeed, indeed, I cannot see. My keen eyesight is obstructed by the guard, by the sudden entrance of gloom. On what account of darkness my eyes, even though opened, are as it were really closed. I cannot see. Darkness annoys, as it were, the limbs of the body, the heavens, showers as it were, black, collyrium, and my eyesight has become unprofitable, like the service rendered to the worthless man. So it is thick of darkness, in this darkness, you cannot see anything, and Vasantasena has slipped into the house of Charudatta. Sakara says, friend, friend, I am looking for Vasantasena. Oh, son of an unmarried woman, is there anything of which you can trace her? Sakara says, friend, like what, for instance? Say, for example, the tinkling of her ornaments, we can hear that. For instance, or that the fragrance of her garland blended with her perfumes. Sakara says, I hear the fragrance of her garlands. See the joke? I hear not the tinkling of her ornaments, but I hear the fragrance of her garland. Can you ever hear the fragrance of the garland? And my nose is still with darkness. My nose is totally filled with darkness. I cannot clearly see the tinkling of her ornament. So this type of joke is, so whatever Sakara says is highly ludicrous, ridiculous. And even when the tragic scene is going on, a game of love and chase is going on, he's a lusty man following, pursuing Vasantasena. His dialogues are very funny. So he is an embodiment of that clown character. Okay, full of hasya rasa. And whatever he sees, he as a prakaran, this is an inventive play, and we often find that the characters, characters engage the audience through these entertaining dialogues. So we have Vita, Vasantasena, Vasantasena, I said to Vasantasena, true is that you not visible amidst the darkness of the nightfall, like the lightning hidden in the union of the interior clouds, and yet the fragrance of your garlands, as well as the tinkling of your anklets, O oh, time one will betray you. Have you heard me, Vasantasena? So Vasantasena speaking to herself, heard and comprehended too, so she's removing her anklet, pulling off her garland, 
walking a few steps and feeling by the hand lo here do i feel the wall of the house and here is a side entrance i understand also by the tactual factual perception tactual means touch perception as my fingers tell me that this entrance of the house is closed so we have again the shift of scene where we have charu datta so we keep up to this so we have uh, entertained ourselves with a fascinating play full of action full of uh, interesting sequence of events so any question regarding this portion of the text that we have read today so as i was i was reading the play i felt that this play contains all the populist elements that a masala movie nowadays masala movies have and the of course mitcha katika has been adapted variously we have um, the famous film by shashi kapoor and his company utsav an adaptation even shyam banegal in his bharat ek khoj based on jawaharlal nehru's discovery of india has presented the story of asanta sena these are all available in the net you can search the net you can see the stories representations even on the stage we have the adaptation modern adaptation of this play mitcha katika by shudraka especially habib tanvir's mitti ki gaadi mitti ki gaadi refers to the clay court clay toy cart that is there at the center of the play so any questions do you have thank you very much for your attention so i stop here so see you again next week with another section of the play act 1 to be continued thank you very much sir Stay thank safe. you sir